All right, well, my name is Brenna Simmons-Sainange. For those of you I don't know, I am the Executive Director of the Alliance Center and one of the co-founders of the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. And the Alliance Center really exists to bring people together to solve systemic problems. And, you know, I think we can all agree that we're living at a truly unprecedented time. We're living through the convergence of multiple crises. And if you're here with us today, my guess is that deep inside, you feel a calling to help make the world a better place. And the good news is that you found a community of change agents united around that same calling. The other news, we have a lot of work to do. We're gathered today in this virtual room to explore the concept of regenerative business. What is it? How does it make the world a better place? How do we go from just doing less bad to actually doing good to healing, to restoring, and then to regenerating. Today, you're gonna to hear from business leaders, world-renowned business consultants with a focus on regenerative practices. And you'll also hear from several coalition members themselves about some of the practices they do that demonstrate regeneration in action right here in Colorado. So at this moment, we'd like to take a time to do land and equity acknowledgements that help frame the conversation and center our work in equity. As Coloradans, we stand on the unceded ancestral lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Ute nations and peoples. These lands were also a site of trade, gathering, healing for numerous other indigenous tribes. We recognize native and indigenous peoples as the original stewards of this land and our presence among their descendants who still dwell within it. We pay our respects to indigenous and native elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of colonial violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that have brought us to our current moment. And now for an equity acknowledgement. We acknowledge that racial justice, equity, and climate justice are inextricably intertwined and that poor, vulnerable, and primarily Black, Indigenous, and people of color disproportionately bear the burden of climate change impacts and environmental injustice. This is due to the lingering effects of systemic discriminatory practices. We commit to doing our part to ensure that when taking any action to address climate change and create a regenerative future, we respect, promote, and consider our respective obligations concerning all aspects of equity and strive to create systems in which everyone can thrive. We thank you for sharing that moment with us. Today is a very special day for the Alliance Center and our community because it marks the union of two of our programmatic initiatives, Best for Colorado and the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. The Alliance Center has led Best for Colorado for about three years in partnership with B-Lab, which is the nonprofit behind the B Corp movement. And while 2021 marks the third and final year we're gonna be leading this program, our commitment to working with the private sector could never be stronger. Business is a monumental force in our world. It shapes our culture, our consumption habits, and our lives. And the power of business can be wielded for extraordinary good. And we're here today to find out how. Over the last three years, through Best for Colorado, we have consulted with dozens of businesses, hosted hundreds of workshops, secured over 950 commitments to action from the private sector, and mobilized a community of over 200 companies to leverage their power as a force for good. And we have a lot to celebrate as a community. And I thank all the best for Colorado companies out there. You inspire us. Keep up the good work and know that we are always here for you as a resource, as a community of like-minded individuals and organizations. And we want to work with you every day to leverage the power of business for good. Best for Colorado was always planned to be a three-year program, and it just so happened that in the third year, as we were planning with B-Lab for what the future of the program was going to be, the pandemic hit. And we all had to adapt to the COVID reality. And it's through this pandemic and through the new unstable world we live in that the Regenerative Recovery Coalition was born. And moving forward, the Regenerative Recovery Coalition, you might hear us say the RRC or the coalition, will be our main engagement arm for the private sector. And the potential is boundless. So before we look at where we're going, I wanna take just a quick trip down memory lane. Yes, think back to the early days of the pandemic, spring of last year, and 
my gosh, at times it felt part, I don't know, reality TV show, part horror movie, part walking nightmare. And everyone was focusing on crisis mitigation. Fear was rampant. It still is. People withdrew into their homes, into their families, trying to stay upright and healthy amidst just earthquakes of sweeping chaos. And it was during these times that the vision for the RRC came. So between March and July of last year, we convened statewide listening sessions, gathering hundreds of Coloradans, people from all across the state, listening to single mothers, farmers, ranchers, CEOs, business leaders, the, gover the governor himself, about how, or how COVID, excuse me, was changing their life and what is the future they want coming out of the pandemic. And this elicited over a thousand solutions to build Colorado forward, not go back to the broken old normal. And these solutions became the guidebook for regenerative recovery. And this report, this guidebook actually functions as a roadmap for building a regenerative recovery in Colorado, which will create a robust localized economy. It will meet human needs abundantly and equitably provide clean air, water, food, and energy to everyone. And it is this shared vision of a regenerative society that galvanized our community. The demand for this future was so strong. The interest was ever growing. And the work, it still feels this way. At times it's magnetic and expanses all at the same time. So in October of last year, right when I went out for maternity leave actually, and a big thank you to Catherine Greener and Hunter Levins for keeping it going while I was out, we officially launched the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. So in only 11 months, the coalition has grown significantly. We now have over 321 members in the state, representing over 21,000 jobs in Colorado's workforce and about 3 billion in managed revenue from our participating organizations. So within this body of change agents, there are three main ways that we drive action. First, we work with decision makers and influencers in the state, so namely the administration, key state agencies and our elected officials. And we help guide the state's recovery plan help guide how stimulus funds are allocated and advance the policy priorities that will ensure a regenerative future for our state. We also work to accelerate the work of our members. And this is one of my favorite ways we drive action is getting to know the amazing work of the 300 plus members we have and find ways that we can help catalyze and amplify the great work you're already doing. We also work on projects. So through the last year or so, we've been mapping what's going on in the state, accelerating the work where possible, and then identifying gaps. And those gaps have informed projects that we are leading, like an equitable workforce development campaign or a just transition for oil and gas workers. Many more projects to come, but those are just a few to, uh, to give you a sense of what we're doing. I'd like to give a big shout out to all the Regenerative Recovery Coalition members out there. You inspire us. And without you, this work would not be possible. So thank you so much for what you do. We've accomplished a lot in a short time together. And I just get so excited. I get goosebumps thinking of what we can do together in the months and years ahead. So at this time, we want to show you a short video that we put together for the coalition that highlights some of our members. And I will say a heads up, even though we've run this video multiple times, there are still always a little tech issues when we do it streaming online. So bear with us. But with that, here's a video for you. Can you turn the volume on it? I, I promise you, we practiced this so many times just today and it's, it still does it. So if, if we can't get when it going. When the pandemic hit, the Alliance Center used this time of change to create a finer future because going back to normal is not an option. Normal didn't work. It was broken. Instead, let's create a society in which everyone can thrive. Let's build forward towards a regenerative future. But what is a regenerative future? One that is based on transformative values instead of transactional ones. The ability to adapt to change and thrive. Paying a fair wage and creating jobs and uh, building out this economy. You have better technology that's going to require less energy to provide the same comfort and services that we enjoy today. We're at a moment when it's kind of all hands on deck around the globe. We can leave this place better than we found it, and we're gonna do that. But let's be real, creating this is a massive task. 
It cannot be done by any single organization or individual. So that's why we form the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. The coalition represents hundreds of change agents working together to create shared prosperity on a healthy planet. We are at a tipping point. How will you use your power during this time of change? Join us to help tip the scales towards a regenerative future. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and please help us distribute it, get it up and out. This is your coalition, that's your video. So we'd love your help sh sharing that through your networks. So the coalition, if you haven't caught already, it's really a collaboration of change agents working across various sectors. And about 60% of our membership actually is from the private sector. And the majority of our business partners in the coalition actually came from Best for Colorado. So while the Best for Colorado program sunsets this year, the vision and the work actually lives on through the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. After all, regenerative business is best for Colorado. With that said, I think it's important to acknowledge that the concept of regenerative as it relates to business, it's, it's still emerging. You can't get certified regenerative yet, like you can organic for food or lead for a building. There's no gold standard to point to, not yet. There are, however, many companies leveraging their power for good, not, not just doing less bad, but actually improving the life, the quality of life for all stakeholders, including the environment, while making a profit. And today you're actually gonna hear from several of, those, several of those companies as well as coalition members. And we'll great, we are grateful for all of you, all of the companies on this journey together, no matter where you are, because we are learning and growing and regenerating together. It's an imperfect journey and we're certainly honored to be on it with you. The next two hours will fly by, I promise you that. And here's just a quick outline of the time that we'll be spending together. So next you'll hear from Jane Allen, who's the Regenerative Recovery Coalition Manager, and she's gonna share with you a few of the coalition happenings. Then you'll hear from Hunter Levins about what is regenerative in general. And after that, we're gonna have a collaborative keynote with three amazing speakers, and I'm so excited to hear from them. We'll wrap up with the business spotlight featuring five coalition companies who demonstrate extraordinary business practice, practices, excuse me, right here in Colorado. We'll conclude with one note from a presenting sponsor and then a couple concluding remarks from yours truly. At this time, I wanna give a big shout out to our sponsors without which this work and this event would not be possible. We have two presenting sponsors for the event today, Moy White and The Green Solution. And then our supporting sponsors, Eco Products, Plant Moran, Oatly, Alpine Bank, Amalgamated Bank, and Western Urban Sustainability Advisors. Thank you so much for your continued support. Also consider donating yourself today. Um, Danny will put a link there in the chat if you uh, feel called to do that. And consider that anyone who donates at any amount today, no minimum, will actually send you a free copy of Andrew Winston and Paul Pullman's new book, Net Positive. And Andrew Winston is one of the speakers you'll be hearing from a little bit later in the show. Now, before I turn the mic over, I just wanna ask something of each of you. So there are eight fundamentals of a regenerative recovery, and they'll be in front of you on the screen here in just a moment. And what I ask for you is to consider these. These were the results of the listening session that we did last year through the Colorado Emergence Series. And just look at them. How do they show up for you in your day-to-day -day life? How do they show up for you in your professional life as a business, as a citizen? And how can you work to incorporate these into your business practices? So take notes as we go, but rest assured, we will record this session for future use. And we'll also send an email out to all of you after the event with a short survey and some resources from our speakers and from our businesses today to help continue the learning and the journey together. With that, buckle in, enjoy the wild ride, and I'll pass it over to Jane Allen. Jane. Hi, and welcome everyone. It has been an absolute joy to join this mighty coalition to meet you all and learn about the amazing work that is happening on the ground to achieve a better future for all. As Brenna mentioned, the coalition was only formed 11 months ago. And in that time, we've been able to accomplish some tremendous things. This year, the coalition contributed to the creation and passing of 20 bills and the allocation of 456 million in Colorado stimulus funds towards regenerative principles. Additionally, we influenced the narrative around a regenerative recovery 
which has been used by state lawmakers and the Polis administration and was detailed in his recovery plan for the state. We are looking to carry this same momentum as we move into the upcoming session, including a focus on policies that support regenerative businesses and workforce development. We have relaunched the working groups this September with the intention of being project focused and action oriented. Our working groups have been collaborating with one another to connect on a series of projects, which I will briefly share about. The Workforce Development Group has been collaborating with partners across the state, including community colleges, industry associations, and credentialing agencies to support the equitable transition to regenerative and clean energy jobs with a focus on BIPOC communities, youth, and communities in, transi in transition from oil and gas, as well as coal. We have support from folks like the Just Transition Office and the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment and have recently applied to two grant proposals to serve this purpose. The Climate and Energy Group has partnered with 350.org to support a messaging campaign for an oil and gas phase out by 2030. This work will involve stakeholdering with various sectors of industry and unions to create a shared vision for a just transition away from fossil fuels. The policy working group has been organizing policy ideas from members, as well as identifying key policies from other groups that we can support ahead of the 2022 session. In addition to this, they're also outlining advocacy trainings and lobby days that the coalition could attend. The Food Systems and Ag Group is working to identify funding to build on the success of their recent farm tour in the Gunnison Valley to continue to strengthen the movement of regenerative agriculture across the state. The group is also working on a partnership between Zero Food Print, one of our coalition members, and the Department of Agriculture to develop a statewide soil health campaign using Zero Food Print as a model for funds from the private sector. The equity group has been developing an equity lens to guide and ground the work of the entire coalition. This will involve stakeholder engagement with various community groups and leaders in this space. In addition, the Alliance Center is seeking funding for a full-time social justice specialist to meaningfully build relationships with BIPOC community partners in Colorado. The Circular Economy and Waste Working Group has taken a pause for September and will pick back up in October with a focus on recent happenings in the zero waste space, including extended producer responsibility laws and ongoing efforts to improve Colorado's circular economy. And finally, the Business Working Group has been co-creating a definition for a regenerative business so that it is accessible and digestible to the average business owner. Looking ahead, the group will use this definition to support the development of an impact assessment that businesses can use to guide them on their journey to become more regenerative. In addition to these groups being project focused, we recognize the need for members to connect, inspire and engage, and engage with one another. We plan to hold monthly virtual happy hours for members to vision, vent and connect, as well as monthly orientations for new members who join the coalition. In addition, the RRC is working with partners like the Equity Project and Project Voice to host DEI workshops for members on a regular basis. While we continue to grow every day as a coalition, we plan to do some targeted recruiting so we have more representation across the state, particularly in our more rural areas of the state. All of this work is not possible without the generous support from our sponsors, and we are so grateful for their continued efforts to drive change and make the world a better place through their actions and initiatives. I wanted to say a big thank you to the Green Solutions for your continued support and your commitment to join the journey of becoming more regenerative. It is now my pleasure to introduce the woman who needs no introduction. She is co founder of the RRC the founder of Natural Capitalism Solutions, and an expert on how to solve some of today's toughest challenges profitably. Through her work, she has consulted governments, communities, and companies worldwide, and we are so grateful to have her time today to share with us more about what it means to be truly regenerative in today's day and age. Please welcome Hunter Lovins. Jane, thank you so much. All of you are going to be hearing a lot in, uh, in the coming days about regeneration, regenerative. It is the word du jour. 
So it's worth taking a little bit of time to say, what does it mean? It's an old word. It was used in various translations of the Bible as a new birth. To my knowledge, the first use of the word in the way in which we mean it was by Buckminster Fuller in 1938. He then went on in several of his books, the latest uh, Grunge of Giants in 1983, talking about regeneration as the core concept of how the universe works, the organizing principle of the universe. Interesting, not terribly useful in daily parlance, but it, it's important to recognize that it's the way the world works. We've talked a lot about sustainability and how to achieve it. My colleague John Fullerton points out that in nature, sustainability is the result of regenerative systems. These are systems that are inherently resilient. They learn from chaos, not just adapt to it. They deliver to us what it is that we need, the fertile soil, clean air, clean water, the abundance that humanity depends upon. It's much more than just the old concept of sustainability. And this word is now supplanting the word sustainability to the point that you have whole conferences that used to be called sustainable brands now talking about regeneration. Here's a bit of a mapping. We're down in the, uh, the lower corner we're destroying life as we know it on Earth. And our challenge is to come up this arc of transition through what's been called green, through what's been called sustainable. You know, people say, I don't want to just do less bad. Doing less bad is important. It is doing more good, and it's not enough. We need, as Brenna said, to move through restoration and create systems that are regenerative in everything that they do. The best definition of what all this means that I've found comes from John Fullerton in his brilliant paper, Regenerative Capitalism. And I'm not going to walk through these principles, but I highly recommend that you download for free this paper from Capital Institute and really study it. In the Regenerative Recovery Coalition, we built on these principles to create the fundamentals of how you implement the principles. So starting with renewable energy, and we'll hear shortly from Jason Sharp, whose great company, Namaste Solar, is doing this here in Colorado. The food systems and our Regenerative Agriculture Working Group has been exploring how to implement these systems here in Colorado. Equal access, equity, this has to be core to everything that we're doing. The workforce, how do we transition from a, an economy that has been extractive to one that is regenerative? And how do we give young people coming into the workforce the opportunity to create a very different economy? All of these work together. Infrastructure, the circular economy, so that we, we stop this concept of throwing things away. As Catherine Greener, my dear colleague, points out, there is no away. Implementing change through democratic institutions and leveraging partnerships. These are all core to how it is that the Regenerative Recovery Coalition has been doing its work. There are a growing number of examples of companies here in Colorado that are regenerative. And actually, there is a regenerative standard now for food created by Mark Ratzloff, one of our partners in the coalition, and the people at Rodale. And there are branches in Colorado that are practicing these regenerative principles. This is so important because taking carbon out of the air and sequestering it durably in the soils, which is what regenerative agriculture does, is the other half of the solution to the climate crisis. 
with renewable energy. The big guys are starting to catch on. Danone has committed to regenerative agriculture. Unilever and Andrew Winston, my friend and colleague, will talk to us in a few minutes about his book with Paul Pullman on net positive, which is another way of saying regenerative. General Mills has committed to implementing regenerative agriculture on a million acres, and it's not alone. Cargill, Target, McDonald's are implementing regenerative agriculture on another million acres, and Walmart has said it is committed to being a regenerative company. Now, is Walmart regenerative? No. But is this commitment important? Yeah. They have no earthly idea what it means, but they're figuring it out. And having the corporate sector join in this journey is what will make it possible in the time frame that we have to work in. Time is very short. We're in a horse race with catastrophe. Good news, we're in the race. These companies that will be represented with us this afternoon are on this journey. None of us is wholly regenerative yet, but all of us need to take seriously this opportunity, because as Andrew will point out, the companies that are doing this the best are more profitable. This is just better business. So as we work together as a coalition, let me challenge us to think about our theory of change. How does change happen? What are the institutions that we need to transform? All of these, obviously, and you can't do it all at once. So we have to pick priorities, which is what we're doing with the coalition. And each year as it comes time for the legislature to meet, we will be getting together as a coalition and collectively saying, what are the policies that we think are most important now to begin implementing here in Colorado to drive this transition to a regenerative economy in Colorado? We used to think of ourselves as an extractive industry state. Oh, we're oil and gas. That's what gives us our jobs. No, it's not. Oil and gas before the pandemic provided the state with something like 40,000 jobs. In the pandemic, they lost 10,000. Clean energy is already almost 70,000, projected to grow at almost 10% this year. We're not an extractive economy state. We're a state that is already beginning this transition. A finer future is possible. Bucky called for a world that works for 100% of humanity, and we know how to achieve it. When we do this, it will unleash the greatest prosperity humanity has ever known. Doing it though requires that we believe that it's possible, that we have this vision of what a regenerative economy means. We can create an economy in service to life. My old boss, Dave Brower, used to say, what do we want the earth to be like 50 years from now? Let's do a little dreaming. Aim high, he said. Navigators have aimed at the stars for centuries. They haven't hit one yet, but because they aimed high, they found their way. This really is the ultimate challenge to all of us, to dream into being the world that we want to see. And now it is my great honor to introduce my friend, my colleague, Catherine Greener. As Brenna said, when uh, she went on maternity leave at arguably the worst possible time, although, you know, kids don't give you a great deal of choice and when it is they want to come into this world, Catherine and I took over the running of the coalition and it has been a year of wonderful moments of great creativity. Catherine is my favorite industrial engineer, and this could not have happened without your help. So Catherine, over to you, and thanks so much. Thank you so much, Hunter, for those kind words. And I love that quote for aiming, to this, aiming for the stars. It's gonna help, uh, I hope, ground this conversation. 
Um, and before uh, we officially kick off the panel, of course, a little bit of administrative function. Um, this is a conversation. It will be a conversation between myself, Jacques Philippe, and Andrew, but yet um, please put your questions and comments into the chat function as well. We will be monitoring the chat function to uh, include your voice. So I got that. So first, gentlemen, first, thank you so much for joining us today. From the bottom of my heart, um, I have a lot, lot of love for both the coalition and both for um, the two of you, and I'm hoping it's going to reflect in this conversation. Um, and thank you for your contributions of time this afternoon in supporting the Colorado Regenerative Recovery Coalition. So the formal introductions of this uh, conversation. Um, I first want to introduce Jacques Philippe um, Pivrugé, if I said that correctly or close enough for someone who got thrown out of French class in college. He is a co-founder. I'm sorry? Did I get it? That sounded great. Thank you. Absolutely. It practiced. Um, he is the co-founder and managing partner of Ozone Ventures. It's a purpose-driven fund that's revolutionary, revolutionizing the way investments are made through the use of collective human intelligence and AI, though we're all wondering about this collective human intelligence sometimes these days. So I found on his LinkedIn um, this amazing quote from your LinkedIn. It says, technology governs the way we learn, collaborate, and build together. And now more than ever, the new normal is being re rewritten. Ozone X wants to support this change by promoting solutions that create equitable and, um, oh my gosh, merit, merit, you can help me with this word. I always like merit, it's French derivative, of course. Um, meritorious education and employment systems that help all rise. That's just a fantastic quote. Um, he's also co-created <clears throat> co and scaled a wide range of enterprises, including Empowered and Relicity and the Council of Urban Professionals. Jacques Philippe developed, and I call his mad skills and business acumen in the finance world, most notably as director at AIG Investments and Pinebridge Investments, where he participated in over 10 billion, yes, B billion of real estate and private equity transactions. Lots of recognitions, I could go on. I just wanna also acknowledge that you have a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University and an MBA from Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. So thank you, Jacques Philippe. And Andrew, I was, as I was looking, um, I'll introduce you as well. I was trying to remember, and I think it's actually, we're now two decades when I first met you. So- um, Probably. <laughs> um, you know, Andrew, I think your name's come up. You are a globally recognized expert on megatrends and how to build companies that thrive, not to survive by serving the world. We could just unpack that alone. I love how you put that in the chat too. Um, you're really widely read, one of the, uh, probably the most prolific writers on sustainable business um, with regular columns in the Harvard Business Review and Sloan Management. And you, H, you're on H, in HBR's cover article for September, October as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, a lot of people know you from your first book, Green to Gold, um, published, I can't believe now it's 2006. And yeah. because you found, on, I think, on most executives' bookshelves. It's even still back. I have mine back <laughs> on my bookshelf. Um, your most recent book that we'll, we'll spend some time talking about, Net Positive, that you wrote with Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever, I think. And it's, it's, an, it's a lovely exploration how the role of business really must change in order to create the world society for future generations. I think it, you know, it's future generations of humans and all of our species. Um, your career also took you to in the finance from um, advising companies on corporate strategy while at Boston Consulting Group and management positions in strategy and marketing at Time Warner. Um, you received your BA in economics from Princeton and MBA Columbia and a master's of environmental management from Yale. Okay, I'm done. Did I leave yeah. up? I think I, I think the time. I think we've used up our time. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, that's the formal introduction. Yeah. And I want to move into really getting to know both of you a little bit better um, by the first question. And that is, I think all of us in this space, we have a defining moment that either led you or turned you in the direction. And I think both of you from your past in that introduction, you turned from really the conventional finance um, the, and the Wall Street investment to your current impact work. Um, 
we really walked away from Wall Street. Why? Jacques Philippe, can you kick us off and take sure, us back? Sure, and uh, thank you again, Catherine, for such a warm introduction. It's wonderful to be here with you and Andrew. Uh, I'd be remiss not to thank the Alliance Center and the wonderful work that you guys are doing. I've been uh, thoroughly impressed by the cadence of what you guys do and how you get it done with you know relatively limited resources. So I'm just uh, I just feel privileged to be here, and I just want to thank you. Um, in terms of defining moment, you know, in my case, I've had at least nine near-death experiences, so I could probably pick any one of them. But the reality is, in the moment, the one experience that comes to mind was the earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010. So at the time, I was working for a fund. We had you know over 500 billion in assets, and I cared about things, but it's questionable as to the depth of how much I cared, although I've been pretty involved for a very long time in, in various activities. But when the earthquake hit and it affected over 200,000 200, casualties, not to mention displaced peoples, it was the first time that I felt that I had no choice. Uh, I couldn't wait for someone else to do something. I had to really step up and be involved in that instance. I uh, got a thousand people together in uh, in Manhattan. Had the governor uh, was involved in distributing over sixty million dollars as part of George Clooney's uh, Hope for Haiti fund. Um, and whatever we did or whatever I did, really never felt like enough. And you know, fundamentally from that experience, my takeaway from there was, uh, you know, we really have to be the change that we want to see in the world. And for me, that meant all the work that I do going forward has to be purposeful and have impact tied in to the core business. Um, I think the days of making money and giving it away later that were developed you know, by Vanderbilt, you know, that was a different era. And for me, kind of you know, the, the issue in 2010 uh, really changed my perspective. And I'd say that's kind of a defining moment that comes to me right now. Thank you for the question. Oh, thank you for that response. How about you, Andrew? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a few, I guess, of, of the moments. Um, well, first, uh, obviously, thank you. Um, it's great to be back speaking in virtually Colorado again. I've come a few times over the years. Hunter's invited me. Um, it is a fascinating state with its oil gas history and the renewable. I mean, it's just it's actually like almost like the perfect purple place that has to, we have to figure it all out. Right. There's a few places that that are somehow all these modes of being are kind of battling it out, um, you know, and it's always hard to follow Hunter. She's so, uh, you know, she's so articulate about about the story of regenerative and what the key elements are. So it's it's hard to follow that. Um, I, you know, my I guess a, my kind of key moment came from being unemployed and I was uh, which gives you a lot of freedom to think I was um, Not in your bio. Wait, yeah, I didn't I didn't mention that part. I was, uh, you know, I, I had left the big companies. My last big company job was in 99, um, which is just shockingly long ago. I, I worked for MTV and Viacom and did strategy and, you know, nothing sustainability. And I left to go to a dot com. And um, my timing was just horrific. The market, the market crash that began the dot com bus was like three weeks after I got there in early 2000. And um, later that year, I got married and basically on the honeymoon, the company folded and um, it was like 30 people and it was a really interesting place. And I turned to my wife, I was like, you know, that richer and poorer thing that we just talked about like a couple of days ago. Um, how do you feel about poor, you know, and, and but it's actually true that I was able to step back and say, what do I want to do? Because I was now married and someone had a <laughs> someone had a salary. I mean, it made such a huge difference that she said, OK, go ahead and figure it out. Um, and I just, it's a little thing, but I, I had this moment of like, I'm changing all the light bulbs in my apartment in New York. And I'm like, this, this cannot be the biggest thing I can do about the fact that we just have, it just was clear to me, there was like a resource issue. Like we just, the, that we were using too much stuff. I was a vegetarian for that reason. And um, I just, I, I knew there was a problem. I didn't know the words. I had gone to business school, but nobody mentioned sustainability or carbon or any of it, which late, you know, later I looked back and was pretty angry about <laughs> like, how can you go through business and not talk about this? Um, and so I, you know, started reading and actually there was just a few weeks in, in, you know, early 2001 that 
was kind of the conversion for me. I, I started with Ray Anderson and then went through his journey of the spear in the chest and read Paul Hawken and, and then read Natural Capitalism. Um, and so Hunter was one of the inspirations. And, you know, there's just a few books that I think once you read, and Ishmael was another one. If you read those, I, I think there's there's people who they learn something and they can't unlearn it, right? And that's that's kind of my my mode in life. And so I had to I had to figure out how to combine business and environment. And that was, you know, that was all just like there was a few weeks in there. And I just said, you know, to my wife, I'm gonna go back to school, we're gonna figure it out. I had no idea I'd write books, um, didn't know what I'd do with it. Um, and then, you know, I went to grad school and it kind of kicked off from there. So, uh, you know, I, I always tell people, I got I get a lot of calls from, you know, MBA students, whatever. I'm like, you don't know what you're gonna do or what you're gonna use or where you're gonna end up. And like, you know, floundering isn't bad necessarily. You know, I was floundering and ended up on the right path. So you never know. Thank you. Um, so I what about you? Who, oh, what me? Was, yeah. Um, yeah, a bit of, you know, I walked away from um, a, a pretty decent um, automotive industry job in Detroit. And um, it, it seems like all roads are um, starting to, to lead back to you, Hunter. Um, I was starting to get involved in interfaith work in climate change. And um, at the, I, I was helping to lead an interfaith prayer protest in one in front of a coal fired power plant that I had to take a vacation day to do. And um, the company I was working for um, actually was involved in some construction projects with that coal fired power plant and knew that there was a little bit of dissonance in my life. But um, that was one of the moments in which I knew that I had to do something different and um, packed everything up, moved from uh, the Detroit area to um, Old Snowmass to work at Rocky Mountain Institute. But it was uh, during, during that time of dissonance and in the late 90s where I saw that this uh, thing called the uh, sustainable development was emerging and I wanted to be part of it. Mm, thanks. There you go. And here we are. And here we are. And I think, I think this is as we're now thinking about a regenerative future, you know, I think for all of us um, who are participating today is to reflect on our past to preparing us for being a leader in this space today. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that in, both of our stories, or all of our stories, we've talked about the past launching us into this. And, you know, in that, in terms, we've come from business backgrounds. And I, and I want to pivot and to think about this emerging space of regenerative business. I think in this work um, that both of you are doing, um, and uh, start, Jacques Philippe, in, in your words, what is a regenerative business? Good question. And I feel like if you ask 10 different people, you'll get 10 different responses. Um, I actually went and kind of looked up the definition of just to regenerate, right? Because I think it helps to inform what the actual word means within the context of business, right? So regrow, reform, reborn. And when you think of regenerative business, it's essentially that, right? And it's not, you know, historically, we've really just focused on shareholders and profit maximization, but there are so many other stakeholders that relate to business. And if they're not all regenerating and regrowing and reborning, then you eventually you have no business. And we're kind of moving in that direction now. So in my view, a regenerative business is one where the business takes all of its stakeholders into account and progresses in the world in a manner whereby all the elements are able to sustain and regenerate themselves. And I'm sure um, Andrew will go into a bit more about net positive, but you know, I think that's the next step, right? So if we had started initially with regenerative businesses, we might not need net positive, but we're so far behind now that net positive needs to almost be uh, the regenerative business. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a good segue for uh, Andrew to jump in. Um, and I think as part of that segue for, um, and maybe um, just to start with that, when you talk about stakeholders, how do you, how do you define as a stakeholder? So personally, and you know, so for what it's worth, this is something that I spent a decent amount of time on because uh, I helped create one of the first B Corp certified companies 10 years ago in the solar space. Uh, we actually went from concept to market distribution in more than 70 countries in those three years. And when we first set up as a B Corp, 
you know, all the lawyers were like, what are you doing? You're not going to raise capital. And you had to respond to a lot of this, right? And, and so for me, I netted out on the idea that in order for a business to really be sound over the long term, you need to take all the stakeholders into account, right? I would often give the example of, say, an Exxon Mobil. So 50 years ago, they could pump crude in the Niger Delta and then sell clean gas in LA. It would work, but that doesn't fly anymore. So literally, you have to take every element of your business into account. So when I think of stakeholders, you're thinking employees, you're thinking suppliers, you're thinking shareholders, you're thinking the environment. You want to map out everything that your company touches and consider what the implications would be if that component no longer existed and take that into account with respect to your planning. Um, and so, and for me, I kind of stopped using the term regenerative or even uh, purposeful business, just business. So I think five, 10 years out, that's just gonna be business because if you don't do that, you're not a sound investment. And, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but if you look at the, uh, the flows over the last couple of years, it's increasing, increasing substantially towards ESG strategies because people are looking for that. You're not talking small numbers, you're talking you know, over 30 trillion in the last year that went into ESG. Now it comes down to impact and tracking it. And it all comes back to your question around the stakeholders and understanding the implications. Thank you. Um, Andrew, um, you know, your definition of a regenerative business, but I also wanna tack on um, uh, one of the tenets of, uh, of net positive and that businesses are responsible for everything. <laughs> so um, like from your definition, and I think maybe, maybe building on, on the concept of, you know, what is a stakeholder in this regenerative net positive business world? Yeah. world? Um, and I see there's questions in the, in the chat about words, net, net positive, net zero, net negative. Maybe we come back to terminology. I think on some level it's semantics in the sustainability field, we have these subtle differences. But broadly speaking, as Hunter said, net positive, regenerative, whatever you want to call it, I think, you know, Paul and I take the, the tack of really the simplest words possible. I know that sounds silly, but I, my experience was that part of why green to gold worked, and I heard this from many companies was someone said, oh, I took it to my CEO and they said, oh, gold, I like that. Like, it was that simple. Like, they just wanted to see gold equals money, right? And so now... I think it's a fairly, it's a simple message to describe, which is that a net positive business is one that, that thrives, it profits, it grows by serving the world, by improving the well-being of everyone that it, that it touches and, and contacts. And that for a multinational, that's, we can come back to this, this idea of responsibility, that's like everybody, right? So it is your employees you know, your customers and consumers, your communities, even the government people you work with, it's, it's the whole circle of, of people that you impact and it, and at every scale. And this is kind of the, this is where I think we kind of are evolving from what normally is just described as, you know, net zero might just be about carbon or about, you know, kind of one metric. And, and I think of it as every product you put out in the world, every service, every factory you run, every building, every region you're in, every country you're in, that your total impact is positive. Um, that's simple sounding actually to, to define. It's obviously incredibly difficult to do, nobody's there. There's actually systemic reasons it's not even possible yet, right? I mean, the grid isn't green, like you can't do it yet, but you can do it in pieces. And there's companies now leading and doing it in pieces, right? They're having a net positive impact on certain communities as they, as they build living wages into their supply chain or get rid of human rights issues. Um, as they help communities develop. And I think um, there's probably more stories on the social side than, than the environmental side. Um, so I think all this terminology that's going around, I think that the, the basic concept is, you know, to look at some of those big threshold models that are out there, the Stockholm Resilience Center, Donut Economics, Future Fit, all these different models that basically say the same thing. There's a biophysical limit or threshold to how much we can use and, and how much stuff there is, right? That's, that is the interest of the world every year. And there's a moral kind of human minimal limit. And in between that is the donut, right? And so the only way we're going to get into that donut 
is to start to heal and, and regenerate and to get the enterprises that are willing um, to a net positive place. And, and part of it, to be honest, is because not everybody will do it. So the ones who are willing, who can see this as an opportunity, need, we kind of need to make up for those who will lag um, until it becomes the easiest thing to do, right? We hope down the road that everybody can make net positive choices in their life because that's, that's actually the default, right? The default is there's solar on every roof. The default is you get an EV or you take the bus or whatever, you know, there's, there's defaults that lead us to a much more, uh, much more sustainable and thriving place. So um, as you were speaking, as I got introduced as an industrial engineer, I can talk about how um, I'm challenged by the concept of, of what you said in terms of total impact is positive and there's growth. Um, and as we're thinking about healing and regenerating, do we measure growth differently? And does it get yeah. measured in a way that also incorporates the social impacts from that? Well, well? if you, we, well, maybe we, just, maybe we could do like an easier question. Now, the, uh, the, the growth one is really one of the core challenges of our whole field, right? And I think there's some answers and answers I've given in different ways and thought about that I'm not 100% satisfied with, but here's, here's how I think about it. And I'll, I'll say I got a little, little kind of evolved and moved on this topic by Paul, because he's he was a CFO before he was a CEO, and he's kind of still about business has got to grow. And, and so there's a couple answers to this. I kind of believe that if you're buying something from a company like a Patagonia, and, and, and they're heading down a path where that jacket is going to be made from recycled materials, regenerative, you know, regenerative elements from, from sustainable agriculture, um, it's all recyclable, they'll repair it indefinitely and on and on. You want that business to grow. Right? We want the ones who are making the most sustainable products and services to grow. The, you know, the other reason, and this is the one that, that Paul kind of got, got into my head, was that if you have brands and, and businesses that are purpose-based, that are, that are serving as part of their core proposition, like at Unilever, there's soap brands that teach hand washing around the world and have reached a billion kids. The bigger that brand is, the more budget they have in marketing and everything, the bigger those programs are, the more benefit there is. But this this only is when it's fully integrated, right? So it isn't like, it isn't that you um, you make all this damage from what you do and then you make money and try to you know offset it. That's not what the net and net positive really means. So those are the the two partial answers. But I will say that, and we say this in the book without too much elaboration, that I think we need a, a come to Jesus in the world on consumption. We we have to. And, but what I think really has to happen is the richest billion of us need to really look in the mirror because we're still, we're gonna to go to eight, nine billion and 10 maybe. And those people need more material well being. They can leapfrog and go to, you know, more digital, more renewable, all of that. But there's just gonna be more stuff, there is. And so I think the billion of us who have produced most of the emissions um, really need to think about it. And there's a line in the book that I probably will get wrong, but it's, um, I have to look it up, but it's from Gandhi saying, the rich must live simply so the poor can simply live. I, I think that we have a kind of bifurcation coming that we need to really think about. And we do, and, and I know no one in business wants to talk about slowing down or using less because that's, that's not growth, but I think we have to slow down the growth of certain parts of the world and of our lives there's not always a win-win solution. The easiest solution to not battle over is this car better than this one is paper versus plastic is just not to use it, right? I mean, that's the, that's the thing, only thing we know. So that's kind of my opinion on it, that we do have to degrow in certain places, but we want growth in the areas that, that improve the lives of people. That arc of transition um, will take a lot of information yeah. Um, in terms of being able to weigh that, as supposed to be becomes, I think, um, multivariate. And I think in that, uh, um, really a question for Jacques Philippe around this, you know, the Ozone Ventures integrates AI into the investment decision strategy. And do you see that there are other roles for AI in terms of this transition to a regenerative business and, or net positive as we're calling it, and especially I think in the framing of what Andrew just described? Sure, happy to, to share a bit on that and also uh, build on some of what Andrew was mentioning. So on the population growth, recently I was seeing a stat 
suggested that that cap is about 10 billion and it relates to uh, people moving to cities more. And as they move to cities, they have fewer children and scientists are suggesting that that's the likely cap. I just wanna put that out there. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, uh, last year I moderated a conversation with Sir Ronald Cohen and he talked about impact weighted accounting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's gonna be something that can be pretty consequential with respect to comparing different companies. And you know, there are actual examples of companies that are in the same industry, large companies with you know, billions of dollars of turnover, uh, which have dramatically different negative externalities in the world and people just don't realize that. So impact weighted accounting helps to provide more visibility into the, the overall impact of a business. And I think that's gonna end up affecting which companies attract more capital and thus companies are gonna to start to behave differently in order to attract that capital. So I wanna put that out there. And then the other thing that you touched upon, which I think is important and we don't talk about it as much is the heart piece because it's hard to measure heart. <laughs> and, you know, we wanna talk about, you know, billions of hearts or something like that, but you can't. But the reality is we already have more than enough resources and technology to take care of everyone who's on the planet. And the real limiting factor is our creativity and our willingness to support one another and to really see ourselves in the other. And, you know, I just think it's important that we talk about that as well, because, you know, that relates uh, to, to the heart piece of what we're talking about. Now to uh, jump into your question around ozone X and what we're doing. And I guess for context for folks out there, so you understand, um, you know, myself and my co-founders created Ozone X not too long ago. And, you know, we wanted to do a few things. We wanted to change the narrative and the target of where capital goes. We see it as a nice arbitrage opportunity whereby historically women, Black, Latinx, underrepresented groups, which actually represent a significant majority of the population, not the minority they're typically called, um, they get less than 6% of the capital. And a couple of years ago, I was quoting 3% went to women. The last year I've seen it's more like 2.2%, for, for, for example. But then when you look at the actual returns and the performance, when they get capital, they return more and they return it quicker, right? So we just think it's a smart arbitrage opportunity. And then, you know, we're all founders and entrepreneurs in our heart of hearts. So we wanted to take a hard look at the venture capital model to see how we can improve upon it and really create what we consider to be the future of venture from a performance and scalability perspective. So as mentioned, you know, I'm accustomed to you know, working with some pretty large funds and venture typically is not even a rounding error within the context of capital markets because the model doesn't scale very well. And so we found that by incorporating tech and collective expertise, we can actually significantly improve the process and that's how we've incorporated. So we have uh, a broad and growing community uh, who's involved in sourcing, evaluating, and supporting portfolio companies. And the performance is coming along very well. And we're super excited about it. And in terms of the future, we see that as a model that can really attract the resources, financial and otherwise, that can actually address some of the biggest challenges of our time. And in our case, it's sustainability, health and wellness, education, and future of employment. And so, you know, what I just said actually lends itself directly into your question as far as applications of AI, because what we've done is we've applied AI and tech and other innovations to the venture capital process, but you can literally do the same thing to just about any business, right? We have a company we invested in that's using AI and IoT sensors to help prevent and remediate wildfires. You know, for, for those of you in Colorado and the Western United States, it doesn't get much more important than that. And they're already seeing tremendous results and things are working well. They actually have a pilot going in Aspen right now, right? And so that's an example where there's a, a novel tech and innovation, the use of big data being brought into an archaic system and process to improve upon it. And we're seeing the same thing across literally every sector. Um, and so, you know, I can go into each of them, but literally for us, the four that I mentioned are the ones that we track and AI uh, basically will affect all of them um, as will quantum and other types of tech. 
So it sounds like that um, as part of this foundation of a regenerative net positive future, there'll be a combination of, of human intelligence, human heart, as well as this artificial intelligence as we go down this imperfect journey. That's some, just quickly to, to one of the things that because so few people have read the book yet, but someone that was not in sustainability read it and he, the he, one thing he said was he was struck by how much it was about humanity and being humane and that really is I think the through line is is not just the the tactical reason we need to be net positive because we have these thresholds it's that we just have to put humanity back into business and that's you know make it you know people centric I, I mean we spent. 50 years now experimenting with the neoliberal thing and basically misinterpreting both Adam Smith and Charles Darwin um, in a really kind of dangerous way that it's, you know, survival of the fittest and invisible hand and we got all that kind of wrong. And, you know, now we got to step back and say, what would a humane business look like? Or, um, you know, there's a humanistic business kind of management group, uh, Hunter and our friend Michael Pearson at Fordham University has a bunch of great stuff on this about how do you build companies that and and you know leaders that are serving multiple aspects of human need not just that we want more stuff but that we also want to bond and connect and you know how you how you serve both of those all of those thank you um we've been getting questions from um the uh the participants and andrew thank you for answering some of those in in the chat we had an early question from duncan um and i'll pose this to both of you in your heart of hearts do you feel regenerate i added that part um, do you feel regenerative practices and capitalism are compatible? Yeah, I, okay, you've been going first, so I guess I can, I'll, I'll let you think about it. I mean, I, look, I mean, the, the, the facile answer, and I think, you know, Hunter's been thinking about capitalism for, for longer than any of us, but the facile answer is that capitalism is just a tool. It's a system. And it depends how we use it, right? I mean, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, but it really, it really is that simple. Meaning, people. I mean, I have versions of conversations like this for so many years, where people say, "Well, I, I heard you, but I believe in free markets." I'm like, "Great, then price everything." I mean, like, this is why, like, let's get a price or a cap or whatever the systemic thing is that prices the externalities, and then we'll see if capitalism <laughs> works. But that said, the current form of it drives wealth upward. Um, but that's that wasn't true in the 50s, right? It was true once the neoliberals took over. If you have a middle out economics, as I think Nicholas Hanover and others have called it, um, and kind of a middle out mentality about capitalism, I think it can work fine. Um, it, it's that we've leveraged it for the benefit of the very, very few. Um, and, and that's where it's been broken, right? It has fatal flaws that that just need to be remedied and and you know one is the, the inequality but the other is that it assumes infinite growth on a finite planet or right? it's just it's just fundamentally incompatible in that way but i think a regenerative approach or a net positive approach actually kind of fixes capitalism right it allows us to use it in the positive direction in the way that we need to thank you jack believe yeah I'd, I'd more or less say a plus one to everything that andrew said <laughs> And what he said about capitalism being a tool, I was actually going to say the same thing about AI and big data. Yeah. It's just a tool. And often the example I give is, you know, nuclear technology. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. And it really comes down to us as the people and how we manipulate and use it. And same thing for capitalism, right? Capitalism and, capitalism and communism are basically siblings, right? It's same continuum. And you have examples of very socialist uh, societies in the world that have better upward mobility than we have here in the US. And you have capitalistic uh, societies uh, that are worse, right? It comes down to how they're applied. And, and I do agree with Andrew that uh, regenerative and capitalism can and should work hand in hand. And I won't say that it perfects it. I don't believe in perfection but I think it significantly improves it. And I think it becomes more thoughtful. Yeah. And, well, I think and, and, and it broadens, better as, we can have. you know, Go as many have pointed out, we have to be talking about more than one kind of capital, right? If we're talking about human, social, you know, all those, you know, the five, six, whatever number people use, then capitalism can work, right? If we're valuing the other capitals. It's um, as someone, someone pointed out in the chat that, you know, government's supposed to be a check on wealth and they've become controlled by it. 
I mean, this is this is a big problem, right? We used to break up companies that were too big, and we don't anymore. And and you know, you, if it's going to work as a system, we have to learn from the things that we've tried. So, like, I got an economics degree, like a shocking, like thirty years ago. And if trickle down, as experimented with through the eighties, nineties, had worked anywhere, then it would be it should be part of the toolkit. But it doesn't, right? It has not worked on any level at any scale anywhere. So like that has to leave the, the toolkit in capitalism because it's part of what drives wealth upwards. So we have to use the things we learn in different places and, and, and hopefully improve the system. But, you know, it, look, these systems get overtaken by power and that's, you know, it's always a risk. It doesn't matter what, which system. Well, um, as our time together is starting to dwindle, um, I have a couple of questions when it regards to, um, your uh, look into the future and a little bit of advice. So one of the questions, um, first one is given the issues that we face and the time that we, the, the, the very limited time that we have to face and address them and the current reality of what business is, whether it's um, still the short-term holding uh, of stocks, et cetera, and still the, the obsession with short, you know, um, um, the quarterly returns, you know, what are the one to three things you would advise us while we're in the midst of this chaos or in this tension? Hunter stated that we learn from chaos. So we have this chaos, this learning moment, this time pressure, but we're starting to see a path forward. What are the one to three things you would advise us to act on? To do, to accomplish. To get to a regenerative it? future. Yeah. Right. All right, you have to go first this time. I got I gotta think about that. Happy to. Um, <clears throat> so a few things to consider. I think when things are chaotic, it's it's like investing like in, in a volatile market. There's actually a lot of opportunity. And I think that's kind of how we should think about it, right? So uh, we can try new things. So I highly recommend that people try and you know be a bit more courageous, courageous with respect to the types of things that they're willing to try. And you, know, you can fail fast and, and try again. And so you should get comfortable with that. That's one. Two, I think having bigger ideas and allowing ourselves to think along those lines and to understand that it really is possible. And you have to believe, right? So that's another bit uh, that I would suggest really think. And it sounds silly and easy, but I found that collectively we could definitely think a lot bigger than we currently do. And then we'll be surprised uh, to find that it actually is doable. Um, and um, so those are two. And then the one other three. Is, so you don't have to do three, but you keep going, keep going. <laughs> well, the, the last I would mention kind of builds on what we talked about before, right? And what Andrew mentioned in terms of what has worked historically, right? So don't repeat things that have failed. You know, there are a number of types of technology that have actually worked very effectively across various sectors. So really be mindful of applying those into the areas that we want to innovate in. And you know, that's you know pretty straightforward. And you know, I know you asked three, but the fourth, I'd be remiss not to say heart, right? Um, be brave and really think huh. with the heart. And I think uh, you know magic can happen there. So I, I highly encourage folks to do that as well. Thank you so much. All right, Andrew, do you have enough time to think? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I mean, I guess there's there's tactical and kind of more philosophical answers. I, you know, what are the few things we need to do? I look the 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 core really of of our net positive philosophy. It really builds through from kind of personal mission, starting kind of with yourself. So that's kind of the first thing you have to think about is is to kind of look in the mirror and say, you know, what, what does it mean for me to be net positive? What's my purpose? I think we, look, we have to build this, you know, 8 billion people up at the same time as solving systemic problems. So there's kind of a personal journey or personal quest that I think most of us in sustainability have done some of that work, but it seems like you always need to. Um, and then, you know, we build towards the story of partnerships and systemic partnerships and, um, there's been so many like announced collaborations in business and sustainability, but in reality, most have done very little. And, you know, we're kind of at the beginning, I think, of real 
that whole that word pre-competitive, right? You know, that I think we're at the beginning of it really setting in that there's no point in competing on a lot of this stuff. Like if we can find a way to reduce carbon in a certain, you know, manufacturing process, we better get that out, you know, mm -hmm. to everybody. So I, I think there's there's a a kind of mindset around partnering and transformative partnerships and systems and 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 seeing the the other people in this vast partnership we need of business civil society and government seeing them as equal seeing them as human you know business not just feeling like government's always a disaster and government feeling like and ngos feeling like business is always trying to destroy the world like we need to come in with respect um and humility um so that's kind of the mindset thing that i think is really critical to to really identify the the, the shared hurdles like in a given system in a given industry or sector and figure out who needs to be at the table to try to solve it more systemically. Thank you. So before um, we conclude and turn it over to hear examples of um, companies and individuals, I think living some of these principles and tenets that we've just been talking about, um, just very briefly, um, as succinctly as possible, what makes you optimistic? Jacques Philippe, yeah, you're on mute. Am I back? You hear me? All right, you're back. All right. Um, what makes me optimistic succinctly? I think there are two broad categories. One is nature, <laughs> and the other is the next generation. I, I feel, you know, oftentimes we take way too much credit for things. Um, I think I over-index and you know, dopamine, serotonin, and apparently it's it's a thing. Some people just have more of it, so that makes me optimistic. <laughs> um, and specifically. Yeah, I think uh, the next generation gives me hope as well. I find that uh, they're able and willing to collaborate significantly more than we've historically collaborated, as well as uh, their facility with innovation and new tech and new ideas and employing them uh, to help solve you know, some significant challenges. Um, so between those two things, uh, that gives me hope that the future uh, is bright. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, that's good. I um, I have two teenagers. I have the next generation, and they give me hope. But they also give me agita. They also give me annoyance, and you know, like it's a combination. But um, yeah, I, I I it's funny. I've been doing a lot of podcasts and interviews as we get ready for the book launch. I get asked this question every time. Now there, we clearly are in a time where people are looking for optimism, right? And and so my my short answer on this is that I'm optimistic about. As, as Jacques Philippe said, the, the youth, there's the Greta factor, like that someone like Greta Thunberg can rise using technology, that you can get millions of people in the street using social media for the right thing. Um, so that does give me hope. And then just the unbelievable pace of change in the clean economy, uh, it, it just has dwarfed everything most, quote, experts in industry thought could happen. You know, they predicted 10, 15 years ago, we'll get to five cents a kilowatt hour by 2050, and we got there by 2020, you know, like, we were moving so quickly that that makes me realize like the, the clean technologies will win. Um, it's just a matter of how fast. So those things make me feel good. And, and the fact that we're, we're having all these conversations and that business is, business is at the table. Like all of us in this field, we won the first battle. Business is now at the table and including companies that have done nothing. And there's a lot of them. So that makes me feel like, okay, we're finally in the game, you know, after many years of working on this. So that gives me optimism. And I'll, um, I'll, I'll shamelessly contribute. Um, what gives me optimism, I think, is that some of this work, of the, not, not some of this work, the work of the coalition in the past year that we've spent and being able to do what we've done um, here in Colorado and to um, plant the foundations of what I think is a movement, being able to apply it locally, learn from this imperfect journey, um, see where this collaboration can actually come into fruition. Um, unfortunately, um, we could probably continue this conversation for hours. Um, I wish we were virtual and that we had some, uh, a glass with some ice in it and some beverages and things like that, because we'd probably um, continue the festivities. But I really, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank both of you for this conversation and this dialogue, for inspiring us and for continuing um, this work. And thank you. I, next time we should rotate and we'll, I, you know, I'll interview you more so we can hear hear your views and you've been in a lot of interesting positions in this in this space um so deal. thank you thanks for having me deal um oh you're on you're you're still on mute jacques philippe
uh, saying thank you. Thanks for having me. This was amazing. And I wrote in the chat, I like to think that this is just the beginning. And uh, now we have to uh, continue the, the hard and good work, important work. Thank you, indeed. Thank you. Um, so now I want to um, just uh, pivot. Um, so we're going to take I think some of this conversation that was at a global and national level and, and bring it uh, really here to Colorado and to help facilitate that conversation, um, I wanna introduce Lisa Marie Main. So Lisa Marie is the co-founder and president for Continuum Consulting Service. She's an accomplished leader, trainer, consultant, executive coach, facilitator. But as I know her, she's been a mentor to both the Alliance Center and to the coalition. Um, for, you always say over 20 years and counting. I was like, okay, we'll just stop at 20 for those of us who've been there for a while. You fulfill the purpose of many roles. You've been um, leading in countrywide appreciative inquiry to uh, Azerbaijan and, and, and around the world. You've worked with Fortune 50 companies such as Elcon, um, JP Morgan, Kellogg's, Procter & Gamble. I probably could go on, but, um, you know, building on your, um, you have a master's degree in applied behavioral science with an em emphasis in leadership and um, uh, organizational behavior. I think for um, your work with us, you have um, helped us find our North Star in this work, and we look forward to this conversation. Lisa? Thank you so much, Catherine. And, and if you had not answered the question, what makes you optimistic, I would have asked you because your voice matters. You've taught me a lot as well. So thank you so much. And thank you, uh, to our speakers, to Andrew and Jacques Philippe, uh, very inspiring. And I'm honored to introduce you to five inspired leaders who are also coalition members, and they're gonna share a few of their best regenerative business practices with us. Um, if you have any questions for them, please put it in the chat. We're not gonna have them answer them today, but we will be sure that we can liaison them to the, to the panelists and get back with you. Um, and you will all receive at the end of this program, a resource sheet that has how to contact all of today's speakers. So if you wanna talk with them directly. So I'd love to see our panelists here. Um, our first regenerative leader is David Friedland with Eco Products. So David, what are some of your best regenerative business practices? Lisa, thanks so much. And I have to say, I'm a little intimidated following that uh, panel. That was really uh, amazing. Um, and certainly is helping me along our journey to figure out how do we continue along our path to be a regenerative business. Um, so I'm David Friedland, sustainability maven at Eco Products. Um, and Eco Products is a leading manufacturer of food service packaging made from renewable resources and post consumer recycled content. And we have a specific focus on developing products that are designed to be commercially compostable. Um, and we really work every single day to try to provide zero waste solutions to our, customer, our customers. Um, so, you know, I think we are on a journey right now, right, of trying to understand what it means about going from being a sustainable company to being a regenerative one. Um, you know, every day we're trying to put waste to work. We believe we can do that. Um, helping our customers divert food scraps from the landfill to commercial composting sites, using compostable packaging as a vehicle to do so. Um, we've helped numerous companies implement zero waste systems to maximize diversion of food scraps um, to a beneficial end use like composting. We have some great examples of that here in Colorado, like Vail Resorts, Red Rocks, Museum of Nature and Science, Folsom Field, Go Buffs, although not a great season so far, and of course, many more. Um, and we think that that work is sustainable, but not necessarily regenerative. Um, so, you know, while we still certainly have work to do, we think there are a few things that we've been working on that show that we're really on the right path uh, toward being a regenerative business. We've started helping our customers to not just divert their food scraps, but actually use finished compost on their own property or within their upstream supply chain. Um, you know, and, and, and in doing that, we think that we can take what was once viewed as waste, those food scraps, and turn it into something that's a value, right? Creates jobs, increases crop yields and plant growth, increases water holding capacity of soils, decreases erosion, and even sequesters carbon. Um, and we really feel like that is regenerative. Um, additionally, we work with communities across the country um, to develop new commercial composting infrastructure that can successfully divert front of house food scraps, including compostable packaging. Um, so if folks want to learn more, I encourage you to check out our website, check out our YouTube channel. Um, and if you want to learn more about getting compost onto uh, needy Colorado soils, 
uh, check out Restore Colorado and our friends at uh, Zero Foodprint. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's a couple good examples for you, Lisa. It is, David. You know, I was going to ask you if there was one call to action of what we can do, but I think you just put it out there for us. And I really like, it seems like you're creating a circular compostable cycle for all of us as consumers. And I'm inspired by what you shared today. Thank you. That's the goal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So our next panelist, Janice Bermudez with Amalgamated Bank. She has many regenerative practices in her business. So please introduce yourself, Janice, and share at least one, and hopefully we'll have time for another as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa Marie, and thank you to the Alliance Center, my fellow panelists, and everyone listening in on the call. It's truly an honor to be here with all of you. So hi, everyone. My name is Janice Bermudez. I am the first vice president of commercial banking for the West Coast region of Amalgamated Bank. We are a national bank, but we have had a remote presence in Colorado since 2016. We're the country's largest B Corp certified bank and a proud member of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. So when I think of regenerative business as it relates to banking, I'm reminded of the words of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, which are, in order to finance change, we have to change finance. So by being part of this alliance, we're using the collective power of values-based banks to remake the oppressive and extractive financial systems that are responsible for the environmental, social, and racial issues that exist today. Together, we represent a growing movement to change banking. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of that. We don't lend to fossil fuel companies, weapons manufacturers, or private prisons, or really anything that doesn't align with our mission and values. So here are two big examples of how we're trying to change the banking industry. A couple of years ago, we were the first US bank to endorse the United Nations Principles for Responsible Banking. These principles were designed to provide a framework for a sustainable banking system of the future, one that demonstrates that the banking industry can make a positive impact into in society. Then we joined 30 fellow banking signatories in launching the collective commitment to climate action to help facilitate the kind of economic transition that we need to achieve climate neutrality. Part of the work of this collective included publishing and implementing a set of measures such as the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials that banks of any size can use anywhere in the world, including right here in Colorado, to track and monitor the greenhouse gas emissions of their loans and investments. I am blown away. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so second, we don't shy away from taking a public stance on the issues that I referenced earlier. And to be specific, they are climate justice, immigrant rights, LGBTQ plus rights, anti-violence and gun safety, criminal justice, workers' rights, reproductive rights, voting rights, racial justice, and economic justice. Transparency builds trust, and we want people to know what we stand for and why. So we have dedicated pages on our website to raise awareness on these issues, why they matter, and what we're doing to achieve change. Being silent is not conducive to change. So I think that businesses should replace that profit-first mentality with bold activities and use the collective power of business as a force for good. Hmm. Janice, I am uh, beyond inspired by all of what you shared, you know, um, to, uh, uh, we have to change finance and, uh, you know, to finance change, we have to change finance. Uh, you've inspired me to want to look at where our company continuum is invested in which bank. So thank you for that inspiration. And it, it didn't go unnoticed the other day when you said, um, where does your money spend the night? Makes me think about that. So thank you so mm -hmm. much, Janice. Thank yeah. you. And our next panelist, Kurt Hands, is with Ampersam Coffee, local in Boulder. Kurt, what are some of your best practices? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lisa Marie, for having me. Uh, I am thrilled and honored to be part of this group. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this discussion. Uh, again, my name is Kurt Hans. I am the founder and CEO of Ampersam Coffee. Uh, we are in Boulder, Colorado since 2016. We're a wholesale coffee roaster focusing on coffee shops, restaurants, hotels, offices, grocery stores, as well as direct to consumer online business. Um, what makes Ampersand unique and the reason we're here is that um, we source 100% fair trade coffee, 100% organic coffee, uh, and 100% of our coffee supports women's empowerment. Uh, we choose fair trade because it guarantees that our farmers receive a fair price for their coffee, a price that allows them to cover their costs of production plus at least a small premium to help them invest in community projects of their choosing. Uh, we choose organic for environmental reasons. You know, a lot of people 
um, choose uh, organic for personal health reasons. They don't want to ingest chemicals, which is, which is a noble reason. But I also implore you to think about um, the environmental impact of choosing organic. Think about where coffee is grown, uh, Central America, South America, Africa, Indonesia. There's a lot less regulation and oversight with respect to what gets put on coffee crops and crops in general. So when you choose certified organic, uh, you're choosing the environment because you know, you're guaranteeing that harmful chemicals and synthetic uh, fertilizers are not used. That results in cleaner water and healthier ecosystems. Ampersand chooses uh, women's empowerment because numerous studies show uh, that the number one thing that you can do in coffee growing communities to create an upward spiral is to support women's empowerment. Uh, we support women's empowerment in two ways. First, we purchase about 75% of our coffee from special co-ops, uh, all women co-ops called Cafe Feminino. Um, these, these, uh, the women do the farming in these co-ops, they own the land, they get paid directly, which is a very big deal. And they're placed in positions of power in the greater co-op that processes the coffee before sale to the market. Uh, second, Ampersand donates a half percent of its uh, global revenue to an organization called the International Women's Coffee Alliance or the IWCA. Uh, the IWCA is a global organization uh, of 27 chapters in 27 countries. Uh, the IWCA empowers women up and down the coffee supply chain by listening to the needs of its constituents uh, and creating solutions, educational programs to help those constituents um, overcome their problems. And then we cross pollinate those educational solutions to the other chapters where, uh, where it's wanted. Uh, the one thing I would like to share um, with, with this group is that, you know, the one regenerative organic practice I'm very proud of is that Ampersand is on a quest to source the world's first regenerative organic certified coffee. And if you haven't heard about it, I'd suggest you check it out. Um, the ROC, Regenerative Organic Certification, is a new kind of super certification. It's got a fair trade organic baseline, but then it focuses on three prongs, animal welfare, social fairness, and soil health. And to me, soil health, the, the soil health prong um, really captured my attention. It's particularly appealing because it's a simple and powerful tool um, that can stop global warming through carbon sequestration in the soil. So super cool thing, great group put this, uh, this certification together. It's very new and very raw. It's only been around since 2017. I'm proud to say that Patagonia Provisions, uh, which is an arm of Patagonia, the clothing company, is supporting Ampersand as we define the standards for ROC and coffee. We're working with an organization called the Regenerative Organic Alliance to actually get the first certifications for coffee, which is, is challenging, number one, for COVID, but number two, all this was written in English. So we're translating it to Spanish um, as we speak and, and applying that uh, across all the Cafe Feminino uh, co-ops when we can. Um, if I can ask this group one thing that you can do, I would say please check out Regenerative Organic Certified Products. You can find a bunch of them on the Patagonia Provisions website. You know, they carry uh, our products and other products. Um, but also just thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, and thank you for your interest in regenerative business. I can't thank the Alliance Center and the Regenerative Recovery Coalition enough uh, for your work to support this important movement. So thank you. Whew. Kurt, there's so much there and you give you gave us so much. You're taking uh, that 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 saying that's a core value of mine, think globally, act locally, you're taking it to a whole nother level. Your your ability to take local action has far reaching global impact very clearly. And we look forward to how you're going to scale this business model for other businesses as well. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Lisa Marie. Yeah. And our next panelist is Jason Sharp. You saw him in the video at the beginning of today, and he's uh, the leader of Namaste Solar. Hi, Jason. Hi, Lisa Marie. Thank you for having me here today. What a great panel first and uh, fun to be part of this. And thanks to the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. I've been lucky to join on some panels and it's been great to have all these like-minded businesses working towards these solutions together. It, it, it's a really exciting thing to be part of. So thank you to the, to the coalition. Um, my name's Jason Sharp. I'm the CEO of Namaste Solar. Uh, we're an employee-owned B Corporation. And I like to think of the three bottom, uh, the triple bottom line business in the B Corp world. And I really feel like our mission sort of encapsulates sort of the three 
three elements of people, planet, profit. Um, sort of what we do is propagating the responsible use of renewable energy by designing and installing solar systems. Um, but today I really wanted to talk about how we run our business and not so much what we do. I mean, of course, I would love everybody to have solar on their homes and businesses. Um, but I want to talk a little, little bit about how we practice as a regenerative business. And I really appreciated that conversation about capitalism and um, thinking about how to think of all the inputs into that model and who benefits from it. Um, so one of the regenerative ones I wanted to practice as I wanted to highlight is the part of our business model um, that is pioneering conscientious business practices. And being an employee owned cooperative, you know, we find that our greatest asset is our people. And a great part of regeneration is to invest in our people and our people in return, invest in themselves and their jobs and that in turn, invest in our cooperative. Um, you know, we focus on being a transparent organization and we really try to empower people with the ability to provide feedback uh, with information. And in response to the COVID pandemic, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and we started by taking the position that we were um, a trusted source of information. And we started sharing, setting up uh, a website internally to share information. We allowed as many people to work from home as could from their job function. And then we really started to focus on how we can support our people being safe and really take care of them through this pandemic. Um, so when the, when the pandemic started, um, we started with an opt-in process. So our frontline workers were allowed to choose to opt in to work in the field, um, or they could, they could take a furlough um, until we had the right systems in place and they felt safe enough to return to work. And additionally, we set up basically what amounted to an unlimited PTO program um, for people to quarantine. If they had symptoms, they could get tested um, and really to take care of our people and in turn take care of the community and, and the customers that our people had to go um, and work on their homes. And, and it was really amazing. I mean, us focusing on taking care of people you know, that was regenerative and that, that they turned around and really took care of the business. And it absolutely has not been our experience that people don't want to work. I think people want to be empowered and to be taken care of and feel safe. And in return, they, they work incredibly hard. We, we together really um, went through the pandemic in a really wonderful way. So I, I, think, I think a success story in regeneration, I hope. Yeah, Jason, many of us here know of your business and your company. We know you're a pioneer in so many ways, but this really gets to the heart, as Jacques Philippe was talking about earlier, and really appreciate your commitment to the people part of the triple bottom line. So thank you so much. And, and at Continuum Consulting Services, uh, we are also a triple bottom line company. We invest deeply in our people. For example, uh, we commit to diversity. We have a, a, a next generation development pipeline bringing in the next generation as our, as our keynote speakers mentioned before. So thanks, Jason. And our next panelist is uh, actually one of my best of friends <laughs> and co-founder of Continuum Consulting Services, Wendy White, here to share a little bit more about Continuum. Uh, hello. Um, thank you for letting me be here. That, that's a lot of great information, a lot of wonderful examples. And I think that, you know, the one thing to say about Continuum is we really want to be the go-to um, consulting organization that, that, that helps to bring, that works to partners with different organizations to be able to bring them into this next generation, this regenerative generation. And we've had, we've been in business for over 25 years and had an opportunity to partner with people around the world, uh, all sorts of organizations organizations from, you know, top companies to international NGOs, and it's a privilege to be able to see this start to come to fruition. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. So would you tell us a little bit about uh, the leadership model that emerged, especially during COVID and how we use that with our leaders to support them in their regenerative business practices? I will. So when, when COVID hit, you know, Lisa and I kind of just stopped everything we were doing and looked at, okay, well, what does this mean for us? And, and how can we best not only serve ourselves and how, and how do we reinvent ourselves to be able to, to, to meet the, the, all of the needs that are coming up, but then how do we also prepare our clients to be able to kind of navigate all of these novel unknowns? And so both of us came from a outdoor adventure background 
background and have been involved in, in you know, a lot of emergency disaster relief type things. And, and there's phases, predictable phases that we go through. And we figured, you know, how can we take those phases that we naturally go through in natural disasters? And then how can we apply that to what we're, what we're working on right now within COVID and, and, and create some sort of a map that we could use that, that can help us kind of think about where we are right now and, and how we navigate. And we realize that it's not, you know, well, natural disasters, it's like one thing hits and then we work, we work through it and it's kind of like a tornado. It comes, it stops, it goes, you know what you're left with, where COVID and the pandemic's more like a war where you don't know when it's going to end. And we just keep on getting hit by these, these novel unknowns, whether it's climate, climate change is a big one, or, you know, whether it's the Black Lives Ladder, Ma Matter movement, we're constantly changing, constantly having to deal with things. So we, we figured there's there's four kind of phases, but we added um, we added the fifth phase, which we feel is most important, which is the regeneration. It's like, how can we use this time that we're going through to look at how do we reinvent ourselves differently in a way that is more holistic and sustainable and loving uh, and, and that really works for all. Um, and so that's our regenerative phase. And what we found is like, you know, the first phase is like, oh shit, everything kind of happens and we don't know what to do. And, you know, it's, it's the crisis and we kind of go inward and there's certain kind of behaviors that happen during that stage. And then we get it under control and we have like an early norm and it's like, oh, now what? What do we do? And we, we kind of start to, to get moving a little bit. And then we kind of, you know, get, get think we're stable. And then another thing hits and it's like, wow, wait, there's more. Uh, and then after a while, you know, probably about now, a lot of companies, you know, we, we've got this. And part of getting this is realizing that nothing's gonna ever change, go back to the way it was before. We've got to get really, really good at doing things differently, doing things more in a regenerative way. And, and that's what gets into faith. faith Phase five, you know, how can we use this time to look at what's possible now and how can we reinvent differently? And we know that we cycle through these phases and we use this as a way to not only reinvent our own company, but then also to help leaders to be able to look at where they are within their organization, what needs to happen to sustain the organization and move them forward. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. And, you know, we often say, you know, our client partners, large corporations, they have the power and the money and the influence to transform the world. And we have their ear. Um, we have their trust and respect. And so it's very important to us that we have tools such as this one, one of many, that we can bring to our leaders to support them in navigating the novel unknowns and the current times so that they're not only bringing in regenerative business practices, but they're also being regenerative leaders, which I want to talk about in a second. But Wendy, in 30 seconds, 40 seconds or less, you know that we are a humane business with heart. We, yes. <laughs> we, we partner with leaders doing good in the world and, and equip them to do it better. Um, and tell us a little bit about Let's Choose Love. That also came about the same time as this model. It did. So, you know, I, I, I was just kind of struck where we needed to be able to think about things and look at things differently and amplify stories of ordinary people doing good in the world. Uh, and that that we and so we started Let's Choose Love, which is a forum, a movement and an invitation for people to kind of like uh, learn and kind of explore, tap into their own visions, their own passions and to kind of pretty much break through the fear and choose love and look at what is it they can do? How can they use their talent their time and their expertise and apply it to a passion they have to extend their love in the world? And at the same time, Continuum, uh, we decided to give 5% of all of our gross sales, which was quite a lot because we weren't even sure how we were going to make payroll back in October last year. And we said, we've got to live our values. And part of our values is giving back to the triple bottom line. And so of that, of that 5%, we are giving um, mini grants through Let's Choose Love mini grants which is money to help fund people that have great ideas, individuals. And then we're also giving larger micro grants um, away to organizations that have projects that we believe kind of fit, fit the criteria for Let's Choose Love. And we also give 1% uh, to the planet, which is part of our, you know, kind of sustainability efforts. It helps to supplement when we travel again, you know, our, some of our, instead of carbon offsets, we do that. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're getting ready to, to make that 
a, a 501c3, we have a lot of money to give away. So or if you could go on and let's choose love.org. And if you know of anybody that, that it qualifies for many grants, please apply. And that's one way that that continuum is living out our values is through let's choose love. Thanks, Wendy. And I just want to take a couple moments just to share a little bit about uh, regenerative leaders. And Catherine and I have talked about that a little bit. And we can have regenerative business practices, but as you saw by our panelists, I would say that they're also regenerative leaders. They are leaders with heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing that the novel unknowns will keep coming, um, none of us really know what the future is going to bring. Uh, what novel unknown is around the corner. And to elite, in order to lead the emer excuse me, the emerging future, we have to trust in our past. We have to trust in ourselves, in our inner selves. And we call that our positive core. You know, what really is the positive core? So mm -hmm. as we partner with leaders and equipping them with different skills and capabilities and competencies to figure out how to do this, as Hunter said earlier, we actually promote mindsets and behaviors and actions that are actually regenerative mm -hmm. as a leader and build their positive core as well as build the positive core of others. And there's four aspects that we focus on if you wanna be a regenerative leader that are at that positive core. One is that you're rooted, rooted in your core values, knowing what your core values are so you can be balanced when the winds of change come. And then with that, you can find resilience and resilience and agility is paramount right now in leading through novel unknowns. And to be resilient, you need to know how to be resourced, how to resource yourself. So we equip leaders to explore that in themselves and build it in others. A place where I think there's heart, it was, as was mentioned earlier, is knowing your sense of purpose or your calling. And if that's not really clear, is knowing that you're valued, you're wanted, you belong. There's a place for you on this planet that's meaningful. And built, identifying that in yourself, but also building that in others. And, and lastly, really critical to leadership is emotional intelligence, right? Self-awareness, how I manage myself, awareness of others, how I engage. Yet it seems as though the world is calling for something even more than emotional intelligence. And we like to call that your intuitive intelligence. When you're clear with your positive core, you're present, you can be agile and lead that which is emerging and do so in a regenerative way. We have a suite of other tools that we use that are very regenerative in practices so that regenerative leaders are creating like a circular energy loop, right? Mm -hmm. They're no longer extracting energy, do more with less with my people, expand their capacity, but actually engaging them and empowering them in a way that they have energy to do their best at work and perform well for themselves, the planet, for each other. But when they go home at the end of the day, they're not bringing home their leftovers, even if it just means going upstairs into another room, yeah. but they're not bringing home their leftovers. They're bringing home their very best. And we call that the circular energy loop, um, building mindsets and behaviors as regenerative leaders so that they can figure it out, Hunter. Mm -hmm. I, I like that, that challenge. Yeah. So with that, again, folks, if you have any questions for these inspired leaders on the panel today and uh, want to learn more about how to create regenerative business practices for yourself or how to be a regenerative leader. Uh, resources and contact information will be provided at the end of today's program. And now I'd like to turn it back to Brenna. And I, I'm sure she's figuring it out. But in the meantime, I want to spotlight my painting, which is Resilience of Hope, as Wendy had one as well that inspires us. Thanks. Hi, Brenna. Hi, thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, that was really an invigorating couple of hours. Thank you so much for coming up on the close of our time here. And I'm really blown away by what I heard throughout the entire event. Such amazing speakers, great companies who are truly leveraging their power for good, not just doing less bad, but as you heard, incorporating regenerative practices into their operations, their, their culture, their leadership style, their business models. So thank you all so much for what you shared with us. We have one more company to hear from today, which is our one of our presenting sponsors for the event, a longtime friend of the Alliance Center, and uh, we thank them so much for their support. They are a B Corp and a staple in our community. Here to tell you a bit more about their practices is Bobby Dishel. Bobby. Uh, thank you so much, Brenna. Uh, Moy White's proud to be a sponsor of the event and a member of the Regenerative Recovery Coalition and both support our clients in a regenerative economy and contribute ourselves. Not only do we uniquely counsel our clients in this regard, we walk the talk. 
my wife fulfills its commitments through its work as the largest provider of legal services that is also a B Corp here in Colorado. We participate in the Mansfield Rule, which works to diversify the legal profession. In the past few years, over 69% of our new hires have been from historically underrepresented communities within the legal profession, and over half of our current employees identify as females. Here at Moy White, we're constantly looking for ways to lead and improve, counsel our clients through what it means to be part of a regenerative recovery, work with clients in the solar and renewable energy development space, and we look forward to working with you to help build Colorado back better as we enter and embrace our new normal. Thanks, Brenna. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate hearing from you, and thank you so much for the continued support of Moy White. Well, we are coming up on the close of our time together, and I really wish that we could be in person because what would be next would be happy hour with drinks and appetizers and wonderful conversation continuing the themes that we heard from today. Alas, that's not the world that we're living in, so uh, we'll make the best of a virtual room, and we thank you so much for joining us today. As you heard kind of throughout this journey that regenerative as a business term is relatively new, it is emerging and the landscape has really yet to take shape. There are so many companies out there making regenerative claims. Some of which you heard from today that I would say are very authentic. Others make me wonder, is it the next era of greenwashing? These are all important commitments, but how do we actually verify what's going on? So one of the elements that we're considering from the Regenerative Recovery Coalition is a concept of a regenerative business impact assessment. And we kind of think it's the sweet spot of the work we were doing with Best for Colorado and B-Lab certification, and then the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. Is there a need for an assessment for companies to better understand what it means to be regenerative? Where are they in the process? And what are the next steps they can take to improve? So we're kicking around this concept of an RIA, the Regenerative Impact Assessment, and we hope that it will become the project of the business working group of the coalition. But we want to hear from you. Is this a market need? Would you use this? Do you want to engage with us to help create it? So we're still in the exploratory phase, but hopefully there's a lot more to come with the concept of a Regenerative Impact Assessment. We certainly are on a wild journey together in this day and age, and it's people like you, it's the speakers we heard from, the companies that were just spotlighted that make a regenerative future possible. And as we close the chapter of Best for Colorado, we hope that all the Best for Colorado companies out there will continue to engage with us in this work in the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. So if you are an RRC member, we thank you so much for your support. If you haven't joined and you just came in today to check it out and you're interested, please consider joining. We'll put the chat, uh, the link there in the chat. And it's a great way for you to plug into this work, to this community of change agents, to be able to share ideas with each other, come together in solidarity, and of course, move thought to action through our projects that are driving action towards a regenerative future. So as we conclude today, again, I want to thank our sponsors one more time, because without their support, our work would not be possible. You just heard from Moy White and, of course, our other presenting sponsor, The Green Solution, and our supporting sponsors, Eco Products, Plant Moran, Oatly, Alpine Bank, Amalgamated Bank, Western Urban Sustainability Advisors. And thank each of you, and for those of you who donated, we really appreciate your support. Now, as you go about your day, as you go about the next few weeks, I challenge you to think of one or two ideas, keep it simple, one or two ideas that you heard from today and just take the first step in implementing them. If you feel stuck, which you might, and that's okay, we're humans in this imperfect journey together, reach out, we're here to help. That's what we want to do. We look forward to connecting with you all soon in our monthly happy hours and equity trainings. And of course, we're gonna be hosting one more probably virtual, maybe maybe in person, but I, I wouldn't hang my hat on that, but most likely virtual, all coalition event, the uh, fourth quarter of this year. And the theme of that one will be building the workforce of the future. So stay tuned for more information on that event and other ways to engage with the coalition. With that, we'll be signing off. And I thank you, each and every one of you, for all the work you do to make the world a better place. It's gonna take all of us. Have a good night and thank you for joining.